Hello, everybody. I hope that as we're making our way into the second half of the semester, that uh, everyone's having a, a good week and um, that we're all kind of looking ahead to uh, the end of the semester and finishing well. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about Elizabethan literature, um, what was going on primarily in the poetry of that time. So in the early 1950s, one of my, one of my favorite writers, maybe someone whom uh, with, with whom you're familiar as well, C.S. Lewis, uh, wrote a book called English Literature in the 16th Century, Excluding Drama. And in this book, Lewis has some pretty high praise for the later part of the 1500s. He writes of the literature of this period that after a somewhat dry spell, quote, in the last quarter of the century, the unexpected happens. We ascend, fantasy, conceit, Paradox, color, incantation, return, youth returns. Now, for someone like Lewis, who was such a fine scholar, uh, and in a book that's so well researched, it's interesting that Lewis isn't describing in technical terms what makes this literature special in his eyes. Instead, he uses words like fantasy, color, youth, incantation, as if he's describing a sort of magic. The mystery for Lewis is part of the appeal. It's hard to know exactly why this brief period in English literature produced such an impressive body of work, but even if we can't fully explain it, that doesn't mean we shouldn't appreciate it. When we think about this period, a, a few themes and characteristics emerge as significant. The context in which this literature was produced was one in which change was always present. It was a context in which upheaval always bubbled just beneath the surface. It was a world in which the idea of order was embraced and the notion of authority and tranquility were, were valued because these things had to be valued. Now we call this period Elizabethan, of course, because it was produced during the reign. Uh, this is literature that was produced during the reign of Elizabeth, Elizabeth I. For Elizabeth, a lot depended on her ability to keep a potentially chaotic realm in check but she faced no threats on a number of fronts, both religious and political, even threats from within her own family. As one critic put it, this was a world of danger and intrigue, a world where devious self-serving politicians, where the, a world of devious and self-serving politicians, a world where the cunning and ruthless survive, where beauty, aggression, ambition could open doors, windows, bedchamber drapes, but could also lead one into the tower or the gallows. It was a dangerous world where personal and political fortunes were fought over by a small interrelated class of anxious, paranoid men and women. Uh, now this critic might be a little bit dramatic about all of this, but this characterization does get at the fact that this was not a boring time or even a particularly safe time to be alive. And so much of the literature of this time was connected, at least to some extent, with this intrigue, this intrigue that was taking place in the royal courts and, and maybe with the political landscape in general. It was also a time when so much depended for a writer on the community that he or she was a part of. Small groups called coteries would often be the primary audience, audience for any work. And these could help a writer's career in a number of ways. Add to this the introduction of the printing press and the way that even the process of creating and, and distributing literature was changing. And it was a pretty exciting time for writers. This is an excitement reflected in the works that they produced. Today, we're gonna look at some of the major figures of this period, particularly in poetry, but also very briefly in drama, some of whom might be more familiar to you than others, just to get a feel for uh, some of the major currents in the literature of this time period and how this literature fits into a, a social and historical context. So the first poet we're gonna look at today is Sir Philip Sidney. Sidney played an enormous role in helping to bring literature into a sort of golden age near the end of the 16th century. Sidney was born in 1554 and he only lived 31 years, but he managed to cram a lot into that time. Part of this had to do with the family into which uh, Sir Philip Sidney was born. His father was an official of Queen Elizabeth and his mother was Elizabeth's lady-in-waiting. So uh, he grew up among very influential circles. 
After studying at Oxford, he traveled throughout Europe, visiting various places uh, for a few years and interacting with a number of European political figures before coming back to England and entering the service of the Queen. He didn't really start writing until about 1578, and he died after suffering a wound in battle in 1586, so his writing career only lasted about seven or eight years. But during that time, he was able to produce a handful of significant works, which weren't published until after his death. And we'll talk about a, a couple of them today. Now, one of Sidney's major works uh, wasn't a poem at all. Rather, it was an essay called The Defense of Poesy. It was written in response to a pamphlet by a polemicist. And to get an idea of what a polemicist is, just think about a professional arguer, maybe like a talk radio or cable news host today, or a YouTuber who's always on a soapbox about something. But this guy's name was Stephen Gossen. And Gossen argued that poetry was a frivolous pursuit. He argued that poets and actors were draining all the masculine virtue out of the nation and that this was a source of many of the problems that England was facing. Well, this prompted Sidney to write this treatise, The Defense of Poesy. It's often considered to be the first work of literary criticism written in English. And it's criticism that both offers an argument for what poetry can be capable of doing, that is the sort of world-changing impact that imaginative writing can have, while at the same time criticizing the current state of poetry in the English language, the, the poetry of Sidney's own day. Now first, Sidney mounts his defense, not just of, of poetry in the strict sense of verse, but of all imaginative literature. So we might call this work a defense of creative writing. In the face of the charges that Gossen and others like him were making, Sidney argues that far from being frivolous, this kind of literature is one of the highest callings that uh, anyone can pursue because it allows us to get at the heart of truth. It even allows us to imitate God, the ultimate creator. In a key passage, uh, Sidney writes, give right honor to the heavenly maker of that maker, who having made man to his own likeness, set him beyond and over all the works of that second nature, which in nothing he showeth so much as in poetry when with force of divine breath, he bringeth, forth surpassing things, he bringeth things forth surpassing her doings. So like a good rhetorician and a good humanist, uh, Sidney engages both Aristotle and Plato in his argument. And like a good Protestant, he brings uh, their thought into conversation with scripture in claiming that poetry is a gift from God, a gift that will help us capture the essence of divine truth. Now, after making these lofty statements about poetry and what poetry can achieve, Sidney then laments what poets have not been able to achieve, at least in England. It might be hard to imagine a time in which someone would look at the landscape of English literature and say, oh, there's, there's not really much there. But that's where things were, according to Sidney, in the later part of the 16th century. And that's a fact with which C.S. Lewis, for one, agrees. Sidney acknowledges that England had produced few just a few exemplary poets, particularly Chaucer. And he points to his friend Edmund Spencer as well as a writer with promise. But he argues that his country has a long way to go if they are going to equal the poetry of Italy and France, let alone the work of the classical past. Now, Sidney didn't just use his eloquence to complain about what he perceived as a lack of good poetry in English. He also produced poetic works of his own. Most significantly, a series of 108 sonnets and 11 songs entitled Astrophil and Stella. Because we don't really read these works much anymore, it's difficult to wrap our minds around just how important these poems were seen to be, even by Sidney's contemporaries. One fellow member of court declared that Sidney was the English Petrarch. As one critic writing in the 20th century remarks, generations of readers would continue to see these poems as not just significant, but revolutionary, on par with the works of later poets like William Wordsworth and T.S. Eliot in the way that they shifted the conversation about what poetry could be. However, none of these poems were published during Sidney's lifetime. For about the first 15 years of, of their existence, they just circulated among Sidney's coterie of acquaintances, his, his circle of friends in the court and his family. They weren't made available to the public until 1595, almost a decade after his death. So what makes these poems so important? 
Well, in his defense of poesy, Sidney had said the following about English literature. He had said, poetry almost we have none, but that lyrical kind of songs and sonnets, which if I were a mistress would never persuade me that they were in love. In his own work, Sidney seeks to correct that problem of inauthenticity. The poems tell the story of Astrophil. It's a word that means star lover, who longs for his beloved Stella, the name which, a name which means star. Unlike the poets whom Sidney had criticized for being flat and lifeless, Sidney is able to convey a depth of feeling here. He is able to confront the tension that love presents, particularly the, the unrequited kind of love explored here. That is love that is not always returned. Sidney's character bounces back and forth between earnestness and irony, between passion and frustration, so that readers see him as a, as a complex character engaged in a complicated web of emotions. It's believed that Sidney was inspired to write these poems by his own feelings for a woman named Penelope, whom Sidney had known when they were younger, but Penelope ultimately married another man. It's also clear he was somewhat inspired by the, the poetry of Petrarch and Dante as well, both of whom had written about unattainable muses. At the end of the sequence, when Astrophil finally has to relinquish his pursuit of Stella and acknowledge that she is the wife of another man, Sidney gives voice to, um, to Astrophil's grief. Now, another interesting feature of this sequence is that unlike so much of what we see in courtly love poetry, here the woman, Stella, is given a voice. She's given a chance to speak, even if it's only for a little while. So Astrophil and Stella remains uh, among Sir Philip Sidney's greatest poetic achievements. Now, maybe one of the reasons that Sidney was able to make room for Stella to exist as an independent woman, even on a modest scale, is because of the influence of the next woman that we'll, we'll be looking at, Mary Sidney. Now, you probably noticed that she and Philip have the same last name, but I hesitate to refer to her as Philip's younger sister because that's how she was so often described during her own life, but also for centuries afterwards. Some of you who have older siblings might be able to relate to that. Now in Mary's case, this overshadowing is probably in part because she herself was so devoted to supporting the work of her brother. She was born in 1561 and like her brother, she grew up, she grew up in and among the royal court. Unlike her brother though, she wasn't quite so well-traveled as women didn't have the same amount of freedom to wander around Europe as men did at the time. But it does seem that Mary received a solid education at home in uh, languages like Latin, French, Italian, Greek, Hebrew, rhetoric, and the scriptures, as well as music and dancing. As a young woman of about 16, she married the Earl of Pembroke and moved to a country estate. And there, along with her brother, she attempted to establish a, a sort of academy of arts and literature like the kind that had flourished in Italy and France. During this time, Mary became well known for the encouragement and support that she gave to other writers as she tried to help create a culture of English literature that her country could be proud of. A number of works by some of the most notable poets of that period are dedicated to her. So she's known not just as a writer, but also as one of the most influential patrons of the century. Because of this, and, and because, of, because of her, the energy she devoted to being a patron, and because of the fact that in the wake of her brother's death, she helped to continue his legacy by completing some of his works and editing some others. She was neglected for a long time as a writer in her own right. But according to a number of scholars, she is probably the, the most distinguished woman writer of her time. Her output should be celebrated on its own merit. One of the most noteworthy accomplishments of Mary Sidney's career is her collection of paraphrases of the Psalms. This was a project that her brother was involved in as well. And while some of her work in this area involved completing his unfinished psalms, she also paraphrased a number of her own. And these aren't just translations. They're not just wooden renderings of the originals. They reveal her poetic gifts in the way that she varies rhyme schemes and rhythms. They also reveal that, that Mary was a student of theology, bringing into the text some strains of, of the Protestant works, especially Calvin. Uh, that she was reading at the time. When Mary died in, um, in 1621 of smallpox, she left behind a body of work, both in her Psalms and in a number of elegies and other poems, that has only recently been rediscovered as some of the most significant and inter interesting work 
of the later part of the 16th century. Finally, among the poets that we're going to be talking about today, we'll turn to the poet whose life and work might be the most characteristic of this time, Edmund Spencer. I say this not because Spencer is necessarily the best poet of the period, although there are certainly a number of critics who would make that claim, owing to the fact that he produced so much work that was innovative and important and so influential to later generations of poets. I say this because Spencer's work and his career unfold in a way that is reflective of what it looked like to be a, a poet in the Elizabethan period, a period where one had to navigate circles of influence and engage the social and political context of the day in order to build a career. Now, unlike the Sydneys, Spencer was not born into prominence. There's spotty evidence of, of who exactly his family was, but all signs point to his coming from a working class background. However, at an early age, Spencer began attending a quality school in London, a school that had a reputation for providing a humanist education. He would eventually go on to study at Cambridge, where he was a good student, although maybe not an outstanding one. He did menial labor to support himself. He made some strong connections along the way. These connections would be of great assistance to Spencer as he was carving out a career for himself. Eventually, these connections would bring him into contact with the Sydneys in their circle. He would become a part of the group of writers that met at Mary Sidney Herbert's estate to talk about great literature. Now, a lot of the conversation centered on engagement with the great writers of the ancient past in good humanist style. And Spencer seems to have drawn a lot of inspiration from these conversations and from his earlier education in establishing himself as a poet. It probably isn't too surprising that the model for Spencer's career was Virgil. And so Spencer's first major work, the one that really began to create some buzz around him as a poet to be reckoned with, was a work of pastoral poetry in the vein of Virgil's eclogues. Those of you who took Humanities 101 may remember uh, this genre that Virgil wrote in the early stages of his career, poetry that, that celebrated the country life of shepherds. Well, Spencer had a similar work entitled The Shepherd's Calendar, in which he took uh, Virgil's genre of, of pastoral poetry and he built on it. He structured it according to the 12 months of the year so that he might more fully celebrate the, the natural beauty and variety of the landscapes at any given point uh, in the 12-month calendar. He was also innovative in the way that, that he employed a, a number of different styles within his work. He experimented with a wide range of of meter and form. Also, this work was visually interesting. When it was published, it included a, a series of woodcuts that depicted the months of the year. And it was bound in such a way as to look like an ancient text. This work is significant, um, not just for these aesthetic um, features, but also because of the way they weaved political allegory into these poems about shepherds. In the midst of these works about the changing of the seasons, about love and loss among shepherds. Spencer also seems to be making a statement about how political fortunes can change just as quickly as the months of the year. In his own life, Spencer had been somewhat critical of the queen. And at the time he was writing this work, he had fallen on hard times at the court. Eventually, Spencer will be given a post in Ireland where he'll spend much of the rest of his career. This political context and the disappointments that Spencer had personally endured make his most famous work all the more interesting. If you've heard or read about Spencer before, it's likely because of his epic, The Fairy Queen. As one scholar says, The Fairy Queen has a reputation as one of the great unread works of English literature. Now, some of this reputation comes from the fact that this work is somewhat difficult. It's long, even in its unfinished form. It contains a complex allegory full of references that even readers in Spencer's day didn't fully understand, and which readers in uh, later, later periods have even more trouble deciphering. It combines and it borrows both from classical epic as inspired by Virgil, but also from more contemporary Italian romances, which Spencer admired as well. It's an innovative work. It, like Chaucer before him, uh, Spencer here is coining all kinds of new words. He's inventing new forms of rhythm and rhyme. And so this is a work that is political and philosophical and historical and religious. And this is all bound up in a tale of knights and chivalry and love and war 
and of course, a fairy queen. The second reason why some modern readers have avoided this work is because of its reputation as a sort of propaganda for Elizabeth, who is represented in the story by the fairy queen. Some critics have seen in the work an attempt to win favor by flattering the queen. Some have used less polite terms than flattering to describe what Spencer was up to. And it's true that in the words of one scholar, this poem can be defined as a patriotic Protestant epic. It's also true that after hearing the first three books read aloud, Elizabeth was so pleased with the poem that she granted Spencer a pension of 50 pounds a year, which was more than she had given to any other poet that we know of. But that doesn't mean that this poem is simply full of uncritical praise for the queen and her court. A number of scholars in recent years have seen that between the lines of this work, and especially in his yearning for the past, Spencer seems to be giving voice to some of his own disillusionment with the political machinations of England in the later part of the 16th century. Whatever conclusions we come to about this work, it's obvious that it's a rich, complicated, and powerful work. And it deserves to be given a place among the most significant achievements of English literature, and especially of the Elizabethan period. It also reminds us of the ways that Spencer, a working class poet who managed to make his way into some of the most prominent circles of influence, embodies the kind of complex relationship that writers had to the political culture during this period. Now, I've obviously spent most of my time today talking about some of the major achievements in the poetry of the Elizabethan age. But as you know, one of the major ways that people were encountering literature, especially the people in the street who weren't part of a coterie or who weren't involved with the royal court or who couldn't afford printed books was through the theater. Just as poetry was experiencing a uh, period of flourishing at this time, so was drama. While drama in the form of public plays, including religious works, had a long history in England, professional drama, the work of playwrights and actors who sought to make a living at their craft had always been viewed as kind of shady. However, in the 1560s and 1570s, theater began to grow in respectability and some prominent members of society began to support it more enthusiastically. So theaters like the famous Globe Theater in London uh, began to be constructed. It's into this world that some of the major forces of Elizabethan drama were, were able to begin producing their work. Now, the main figure that we'll talk about in this regard, of course, is William Shakespeare, uh, whose work you'll be reading uh, this week. While we don't know uh, Shakespeare's exact birth date, we do know that he was baptized on April 26th, 1564, which probably means he was born a few days before that. Uh, as a side note, a few, uh, a few years ago on the Humanities Tour, we were visiting um, a church in Stratford-on-Avon, uh, uh, Stratford which is Shakespeare's hometown. And um, I found myself sort of leaning against a, a piece of furniture. Um, and, and as I read some, some plaques on the wall and, and then my, my eyes sort of scanned over to a plaque right next to where I was leaning. And I realized I was uh, standing and, and leaning on the, the baptismal font, standing on the floor and, and leaning on the baptismal font where Shakespeare was baptized. Um, so that's a little taste of the kind of history you can get up close and personal with uh, if you ever get to visit these places. Um, so we know that Shakespeare was baptized on April 26th, 1564. Um, his family, like Spencer's, wasn't part of the nobility, but seems to have been a, but his father seems to have been a, a fairly well-off glove maker. Shakespeare was educated, but not as far as we know in any kind of prestigious institution. However, his plays do show that he had an extensive knowledge of the classical world and an extensive knowledge of rhetoric. From about 1594 till about 1613, he wrote some plays. Now, obviously that's an understatement. He wrote some of the most famous, most celebrated plays that we have. In one five-year period at the very end of the 16th century, Shakespeare wrote King John, Richard II, Henry IV, A Midsummer Night's Dream, The Merchant of Venice, as you like it, much ado about nothing, The Merry Wives of Windsor, and Julius Caesar. That's nine plays in three different genres, history, comedy, and tragedy in five years. Some of his other major tragedies, including Othello, Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear, would all come in the next decade or so. Even though Shakespeare had not been brought up in the sphere of the rich and the famous, Shakespeare's work did bring him quite a bit of money and quite a bit of fame. 
including eventual recognition and commendation from King James. But it's also worth mentioning that Shakespeare was not the only important or interesting playwright working in the Elizabethan period. People like Christopher Marlowe and Ben Jonson were also creating plays that wove together historical and classical elements. And Thomas Kidd's Spanish Tragedy, a revenge play that is sometimes seen as a rough predecessor to Hamlet, is a, a crazy, messed up, entertaining play that was very popular, one of the blockbuster works of the later part of the 16th century. Now, while I've mainly focused on the works of Elizabethan poets today, it's important to be reminded, especially as we get into our, our reading and viewing of Shakespeare, that just as with poetry and prose, the Elizabethan period was an incredibly fertile period for drama, not just in spite of its interesting political and social and religious tensions and complications, but even because of them. Thanks for your attention.